Hello and welcome to the event plus activities of the Circle Economy at Harvard Symposium, where we will be talking to the people making the Circle Economy happen, rethinking how we design, make and reuse everything. Today we will be discussing a very important theme for the Circle Economy, climate change. I am Sergio Sinto, a Sustainability Transition Management expert uh, on Circle Economy and founder of the Sustainability Literacy. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Cédric Riegenbach, founder and chairman of the association La Fresque du Climat. Welcome, Cédric. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you, Sancho. Uh, La association La Fresque du Climat was created in 2010 with the goal to spread the Climate Fresque workshop, train facilitators and upskill them. Its purpose is to publicize and disseminate the Climate Fresque game, which aims to raise climate science awareness among a maximum number of people around the world. The Climate Fresque is an awareness game on climate change played already by over 230,000 people and present in more than 50 countries and translated in 35 languages. About Cédric, I will go over my notes. Cédric, is a, Cédric Riegenbach is an engineer, graduated from the École Centrale de Nantes, he taught energy climate issues in higher education and continues to do so in conferences. In 2015, Cédric created the Climate Fresque, a pedagogical workshop based on the IPCC reports and has been working to disseminate it since 2018. He is the founder and the chairman of the association La Fresque du Climat. He is also the CEO of Blue Choice, a consulting company in strategy on climate and transition issues. Thank you again for, for coming in uh, today, Cedric. I know that you are super busy, especially now after mm -hmm. the, the great success of the Climate Fresque and the COP. Uh, just to start out our conversation, how did climate uh, literacy or climate education became your, uh, your focus initially? Um, it started in, uh, I think in 2007, 2008, and I looked at uh, conferences of uh, a guy called Jean-Marc Jancovici. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't know him abroad, but in France, he's very famous among people who work on uh, climate change issues. He developed the, the carbon footprint methodology for France, which inspired the GHG protocol afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I looked at his conferences and I, I really got shocked and, and I, uh, I, a few months later, I decided that I should work in this, uh, in this topic. So I read IPCC reports uh, and I start to train myself uh, by reading a lot of things. And that's how I, I got, uh, I became a climate expert after a few, a few months of readings. Um, and how did the, the idea of the, the Climate Fresque uh, first came, uh, came about? Uh, and actually, I would also have, maybe if we explain to our audience a little bit uh, uh, yeah, what, what is the it? Climate Fresque is. Yeah, okay. So what, what, what is the Climate Fresque first? It's a, it's a workshop. Uh, it's a playful workshop. That's why we call it a game sometimes. And um, it's based on a deck of cards. And you have 42 cards that people have to put in order, in order of cause and effect. So you play in teams. You have a team of uh, five to seven people around the table, and they will be given a few cards, and they have to put them in order of cause and effect. So they start with seven cards, and then we add up a few more cards, and so on. And at the end, they are in front of a big table, two square meters of paper on the table, and uh, and there are. 42 cards and many connections between the cards and all the connections are connections of cause and effect and by doing that you really learn a lot about climate change mm -hmm. <clears throat> because uh, it's a very interactive uh, moment the fact that you you work in team it forces you to to think about it to to argue to disagree to make mistakes to correct yourself etc Mm -hmm. It's a very, very powerful way to learn things. So that's, that's how it works. And uh, how did I happen to, to think about this format? It's a bit by chance, in fact. I teach climate change since I, since I train myself uh, about it. So I trained myself in uh, 2007. 
And then uh, right away, I started to give conferences and lessons about climate change. And uh, one day, it was in 90, uh, 90, uh, yeah, in 20, 20, uh, 15, uh, I tried something. I tried a format because uh, I wanted to do I wanted to do something different from a top down conference. And, uh, and I tried a format where I gave a few graphs of IPCC reports to my students and I asked them to, to find the connections between the graphs. Mm. And, um, and I realized that it was very powerful to learn about climate change. And from that moment on, I decided that I would use that format every time I teach climate change. <clears throat> and that's how I, I started to improve it every time. Every time I use it, I change a few things and it, it, become, it became uh, better and better and it became more and more self-sustaining. And mm -hmm. after a few years, uh, I decided that I, I should spread it as largely as possible. And I created the association, uh, as you said, in uh, 2018. And it's a great tool because it's based on the IPCC report. So it's uh, no. the, the latest information we have on scientific data. And uh, yeah. also because it really creates an emotional connectance uh, with the audience, which drives people into to action, right? And and a big strong point is uh, uh, for my personal experience because I, I played and facilitate the game in Amsterdam, is that it's such a versatile tool. You can use it for a CEO of a company, you can use it for a manager, but you can use it for a housewife or a general um, anybody that is interested in, in climate change. So it's a really really great tool. Um, during the, the recent COP, um, you had a, a huge mobilization um, during the Climate Fresque to uh, bring awareness on uh, climate change. Um, how did that work? What was your, your work there and uh, what was your, were your results? Yeah, the, the, the purpose for us at COP was to, to uh, get as many contacts as possible worldwide. Um, the, the game is already present is in uh, 50 countries. It has been translated in 35 languages. So we are already a global association, but we want to be even more global now. And we want to, to have contact at the government level in, in these countries. So we, we did a good job because we, we managed to, to, to speak with, uh, I think, uh, 10 uh, ministers of different countries. Uh, we have um, we have trained people in uh, in many new countries uh, also, and um, and we have uh, we have gathered uh, more than one thousand business cards that we now need to process <laughs> and to reach the people and to put them in touch with uh, local contacts uh, like you, for instance, <laughs> and. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we, we, we were really happy with that. Uh, not really happy with the result of the, the, the negotiations themselves, but we were not here to attend the negotiations. We were more here to attend the, the, the side events, mm -hmm. the, the off um, events. And, uh, and yeah, it was great for, for that. And so, of course, the, the Climate Fresque started in France and you have already a legion of, uh, of people helping helping you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to include myself in that in that group. Um, but the big the majority density is in Portugal. Uh, oh, sorry, Portugal. That's where I'm from uh, <laughs> <laughs> is in France. It's of course concentrated in France and spreads more around uh, around uh, around Europe. Um, is there uh, any main focus that you would like to, to reach out to? Um, especially thinking that uh, we have our uh, Harvard Academia audience uh, that we hear, so the American audience mainly. Uh, would you like to, to, to share your ideas here? Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to invite uh, other people who still don't know the climate risk to, to get involved and to, well, first try it because uh, um, there's not not such a thing than just trying it. Uh, so you can go on the website climatefresque.org. So it's written fresque like uh, it's a new word. It's a, a F R E S K. So an invented word ba based on the French uh, the French word for fresco. Mm -hmm. 
And um, <clears throat> on climatefresk.org, you will find uh, many occasions to follow uh, an event, so a, a workshop, uh, maybe close to your place, ideally, and otherwise an online event, because we can also organize the climate fresk on a Zoom and a mural to, to be able to do it uh, distantly. And, um, and then if you like it, then, then get trained and become a moderator because it's a very, very nice way to spread knowledge about climate around you. Yeah. And again, it's uh, as a personal experience is super, super rewarding to to do so. So I also yeah. invite everybody to, to try it out. Yeah, every time, every time you moderate a, a workshop, it's a, it's a new experience and it's, a, it's, a, it's always a very good experience to, to see the, the light in the people in the people's eyes. Yes. The, 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 the sparkle, they, they really understand something and they, 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 have move, they are moved. They, there's a lot of emotion also. And yes. it's, it's great. A clear impact and uh, you also always learn um, a yeah. lot from everybody, yeah. especially because yeah. as you, uh, we always emphasize in the game, um, the people who facilitate the game are not experts. They're just uh, common people who use scientific data uh, based on the IPCC, but so anybody can do a, can do facilitation. Going a little bit back to what we were speaking, um, the results of COP were a little disappointing, right? To, to the expectations that we had uh, and what we wanted for climate change. Where would you think that we failed mainly and what would be the, the outcomes you were expecting? It's, uh, I, I didn't expect much from, from the negotiation, to, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very complicated topic. Um, to me, this negotiation, they, they, are, they are useful for one reason. It's a moment when, where, when all the countries can come and say uh, where, where they stand. So we went that far. We, did, uh, we, we put uh, in place this measure. We did this and this. And what did you do? So they, they will uh, look at each other and say, oh, he went further than me, so maybe I should accelerate a little bit. And that's what happens. And uh, many countries are still very uh, late uh, compared to others. And, uh, and this will not change dramatically, unfortunately. So <clears throat> um, you have this, uh, it's, it's uh, it's like an association of co-owners in a building. Imagine they all uh, they gather every year to, to make decisions about uh, how, should we, how, how much should we pay for the elevator and, and, and the cleaning, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that uh, for the elevator, it depends on if you live on the first floor or the last floor, you don't pay the same amount. And, um, and the cleaning, same. And, and you don't have the same means also. So it's... It's a nightmare, and it's it's almost impossible to have every, to to have everybody agree on something. So there was kind of miracle signing a Paris Agreement already, and um, even if it's not sufficient, it was already a very very big step forward. And uh, unfortunately, with Glasgow, uh, the the text signed in Glasgow is is uh, very uh, deceiving. Uh, it's. Uh, we, we were expecting much more, but uh, it's, I mean, it's like this. We, we, we should not expect too much from, from this negotiation. Yes, and we should also expect to put action in our hands. Um, I wanted to speak to you a little bit about the, the priority we give um, to, to climate change uh, and thinking a little bit about the, the planetary boundary framework, what I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, proposed by the Stockholm Resilience Sentence center uh, by Jack Rallstrom. Um, and climate change is without a doubt one of the most important and interlinked boundaries within the nine planetary boundaries uh, proposed by the, the, the Stockholm Resilience Center. But there are other boundaries that are already overshot um, with that definition of the planetary boundaries like uh, nitrogen, loss of biodiversity, um, and even the ongoing crisis of corona is uh, thought, though not scientifically proven, to be linked to loss of biodiversity, so invasion of natural spaces. Um, and so how, how come, you know, how come 
we just are able to address one challenge at a time since that these things are so interlinked how can we afford not to address several of them at a time <laughs> you're right we need to address uh, different uh, topics and uh, the different boundaries uh, at the same time but it doesn't mean that everybody has to take care of all the different topics so maybe uh, focus on one thing and even within one topic for instance climate change or biodiversity within one subject choose one project <laughs> in one subject mm -hmm. and do it uh, as far as you can um, so there are plenty plenty of things to do and it's true that you need to be aware of the different uh, the different uh, planetary boundaries the different limits we are facing we are facing uh, because if you if you make decisions to solve one issue and these decisions will uh, impair another topic then you well, you, don't, you, you don't go in the right direction mm -hmm. so it's important to have at least a little bit of knowledge on the different subjects I mean even the, uh, at least the biggest one climate change biodiversity for instance and the limits on the resources also and if you don't have this um, a general, a general knowledge on each of these topics, then you may make mistakes. Uh, but then, then choose one topic and, and go uh, deeper in, the, in this. Mm -hmm. You have to specialize. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, total, totally agree with you. You can't, it's like the SDGs, for example. You can't address the, mm -hmm. the 17 SDGs. You have to yeah. choose what is more strategic to you and to your company and where you can work from. Um, another super interesting concept that is also very pertinent to uh, from the planetary boundaries, but uh, pertinent to to the climate change, is this tremendous pursuit of consumption, of growth, of GDP that we have, and so we have to transition from a, a collective uh, trends of growth without limits yeah. um, to a growth more diversified without limits. Um, how, how do you think we can um, help people uh, shift towards this uh, a more diversified growth and with other qualities? Hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, ideally, uh, we should manage, ideally, if we could uh, change people's mind about consumption, that would be great. By that, I mean, um, today, we, we have a job in order to make money, in order to, to make a living. And that's an issue because we should have a job not to make a living. We should have a job because it's useful. Because we provide something to somebody else. We manufacture something, we give a service, we do something. And, and by the way, if you do that, you need to be paid. But that's secondary. And it has to be paid in a fair way. Mm -hmm. but still it's secondary you you do your job because you are useful to somebody else and mm -hmm. that should be the first thing and if we rethink the whole economy in this way then well first there are a lot of jobs that don't uh that that are don't go on yeah. because they are not useful i mean mm -hmm. many many jobs are not useful and it's a it's really uh it's really uh, amazing when you think about it yeah. um that don't bring true done. value yeah yeah so sometimes, sometimes um, your job is to to be able to have people pay for something, something that could be for free or it could be financed by thank you money. Mm -hmm. But you have to put a lot of things in place to to get paid for this service, and uh, and and it's uh, it's kind of waste in mm -hmm. fact when you think about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what well, is it was that was just an example, but yeah, many many jobs are don't provide anything to the to the society or maybe they provide something to, to a, a specific person but mm -hmm. against the, the rest mm -hmm. so but that's that would be a, an ideal target in the meantime what do we do because <laughs> we, we, it will take centuries before we get that mm -hmm. because be, before we get there uh what do we do in the meantime um well uh, circular economy is a is a, is a great uh, target because when you think of, of the different ways you can uh, you can uh, reduce the emissions of CO2, uh, you can you can decarbonize the energy 
but so far it doesn't work. I mean, we maybe we developed some renewables and nuclear, but uh, the additional production of decarbonized energy is much lower than the additional production of fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to do to compare something that you, that, is, that you can compare, is it's not compare the, the the variation of each. It's to compare the whole production of renewables, for instance, mm -hmm. with just the increase in fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And if you if you make the comparison, you will arrive to this uh, tremendous result. The whole production of of uh, renewable worldwide in one year equals just the variation of the fossil fuel during one and a half year. In 18 months, the increase in fossil fuel production in energy is more than what we produce with the whole renewables in the world. Yes. So when you realize that, you say, OK, of course, we need more renewables and, and maybe nuclear if you are not against nuclear. But the job is not here. The job is to reduce the whole consumption of energy. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's, it's not this renewable is, is not replacing fossil fuel. It's just mm -hmm. adding up. Especially when you so, consider the growth of the population that we're going to have. Exactly. Today. Yeah, exactly. So, so we have uh, we have this issue. So, so decarbonizing, decarbonizing the mix will not be enough, and uh, the best way to do is is to reduce the consumption of energy. So, another way to do it is to work on uh, efficiency, to uh, eco uh, energy efficiency, and that's something we always do, because we are intelligent. So we improve things, and we by improving things we gain. One to two percent a year on energy efficiency. That is, we are able to uh, to do the same amount of GDP with one or two percent less energy mm -hmm. each year. We gain one to two percent each year. But look, what we need to do with fossil fuel, I mean, I mean, with GHG uh, emissions, it's minus five to ten percent each year. I mean, it's minus five percent a year mm -hmm. uh, globally on a worldwide scale, mm -hmm. which means that it's could be something like minus 10% in developed countries, if you want to be fair. Yeah. So we are very far from that. Mm -hmm. On the decarbonize, decarbonization of the mix, we, get, we go nowhere. We don't decarbonize it so far. With energy efficiency, we gain 1% to 2%. So now what do we do? Do we, do we go into degrowth or do we do something else? Yes. And uh, the fact is that GDP is not the right indicator to think about the topic because, um, you know, it doesn't measure the right things. Mm -hmm. If your job is useless, it still creates GDP. Yeah. But you could give up your job and uh, and if it's useless, I mean, things should be okay. So it's a degrowth in GDP, but it's not a waste for, for, the, for the whole humanity. And um, so... So GDP is not the right indicator. And imagine that you have the, the possibility in, uh, in five to 10 years to double the life expectancy of some products. Mm -hmm. Then you reduce the GAG emissions by the same rate. So if you double the, the life expectancy, then you divide by two the emissions of this specific sector. Is it a loss in GDP? Well, it depends. Uh, if, your, if your provider just sells you, for instance, a cell phone or, or something, if you buy a cell, a cell phone mm -hmm. every two years instead of every one year, yeah. then your provider will lose half of its, of its turnover, of its income. Yeah. But if his job is to, is to rent you a telephone, then it will remain the same, uh, the same income for him, and you will be happy because you have, for you, you spend the same amount of money, but you change your telephone every two years instead of every one year. I mean, if it's if it's okay for you, so it means that the 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 service will not be to to sell you a device; it will yeah. to sell you a service, and uh, you will be able to have a cell phone at any moment. And if it breaks, you give it back to this provider; it will uh, repair it or it will break it into pieces to recycle it and to, to keep part of the pieces that still work to give you another one that is not completely new, but it works. Yeah. And it's okay. So that's, that's circular economy. Yeah. And when you do that, mm -hmm. when you do that, you can, you can gain a lot 
on emission and without decreasing the service. Yes. So, for instance, multiplying by two uh, the life expectancy of, of objects, we divide by two the emissions, and that's something that if, we, if you really want to do something on, I don't know, on telephones, on laptops, I think we can do that. We can do a, run a project like that if we really want in five to ten years. And that's precisely what you need to do. Divide the emissions by two on such periods. Yeah. And, on, and on many topics, you have, you have uh, things to do like that that, uh, that are massive. You can mm -hmm. decouple the, the service that you provide and, and the emission by very large factors. Yeah, and you spoke of a, a lot of uh, super important circular economy concepts there. And uh, uh, two things, two super important uh, aspects came to mind there. Um, first, the planned obsolescence, right? That's, so that's what you're speaking about, that products are, are actually designed not to perform, so we have to buy new ones. Or even if they perform... Yes, you, you, know, you know, sometimes it's not, by, it's not on purpose. But, you know, marketing, um, exactly, exactly. You, you, to you, when, when, when people have the choice, when people have the choice between two products and one is more expensive, but it will last much longer, what do they choose? They choose the cheapest one. Mm -hmm. So the, the customer are uh, partly responsible yeah. for this planned obsolescence. So it's not only the manufacturers, mm -hmm. but still there is obsolescence. I mean, it could be much better. Yes, if yes. everybody if everybody has an interest in that more conscious choices um, mm. another aspect that uh, that comes to this is the from the pursuit of growth is uh, the the blindness I think that we are starting to get in the absolute ne necessity to measure everything to measure sustainability circular economy but also carbon emissions so what I'm starting to see especially in concerning ESG reporting that is mandatory for companies that are uh, listed. But in 2023, in January, it will be mandatory for companies over 2050. So in fact, in the next few years, in the next two years, you're going to see a massive increase, especially in carbon accounting. So the race is going to be, I, 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 I fear that the race is going to be more to, to be able to measure than actually to do meaningful impact and identify your hotspots um, and, and work on them. Um, do, do you agree with this, uh, this thought that there's this uh, danger of people just trying to measure no, and I mean, taking it's, action? Uh, no, I don't, I don't see it as a danger because if people are already motivated to decrease their impact, they will do it. Mm -hmm. And if they are not ready to do it, they will be forced to measure. Mm -hmm. And once they measure things, they, will, they may think about, by the way, can I reduce that? Mm -hmm. And they will be able to do it. But uh, um, it's not uh, it's not a danger. It's uh, the fact that you start to measure the, the things the right way is a very, very good start. And it's, a, it's something you need to do anyway if you want to go further. So it's cool. And people who, who people who were already willing to to do something, mm -hmm. they will do it. Yeah. Mm. Um. <clears throat> what do you think about um, pricing carbon? Uh, there's a lot talked about it. There's a system change uh, in, in place in Europe, and uh, uh, there's a recent study from the German aid, uh, German environmental agency that places the cost of carbon externalities at around 180 euros. So that's the cost that we uh, per ton. So. Um, do you think carbon pricing would be a, a good way to go forward, uh, not only for prices for companies, but also for, for people? Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of the things we need to put in place and it's uh, it won't be enough, mm -hmm. but it's very important to do it. Uh, to say that carbon, carbon should be priced at 180 euros a ton does not really mean something. I mean, you, you, you can do it today, but you can, if you do the same calculation in 10 years, it's going to be a different figure. So you need to be really aware of that. It has, it has a meaning in a very precise context and scenario. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex, complicated topic, the carbon pricing. But what we need to do, of course, is to, to, to give a signal. So the carbon price can come, can come from different 
uh, mechanism. You have the carbon tax, you have the, the, uh, the, the cap and trade uh, systems like we have in Europe with the EU ETS. And um, <clears throat> both have different uh, advantages and uh, drawbacks. Mm -hmm. So the carbon tax is very, uh, it's nice for one reason, which is, you know, in advance the price of carbon and you are able to calculate if you will make an investment in a low carbon technology, because you will be able to know if you have a feedback or not, a financial feedback. So with the carbon, carbon ta tax, you have this opportunity to be able to make calculations and then you make a decision and you go or not into an, a certain technology. With UETS, uh, you don't have this, uh, this advantage. You don't know the price in advance. But the advantage is that uh, you know the global quantity emitted on the perimeter that is uh, concerned. Mm -hmm. So it's another advantage. Ecologists should prefer the, carbon, the, 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 the cap and trade mm -hmm. mechanisms. Ecologists prefer the taxes because they don't like the companies and they want uh, to the, the bad people to pay a tax to punish them, etc. You see, it's a question of it's a really question of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. The reason why people prefer the tax or the the market. Mm -hmm. So, the the market has this advantage that you know in advance the the path, the trajectory of the emissions. But the consequence is that you don't know the price. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know the price, then the, people, the company will not make any investment because they don't know if they, if they will have a feedback on this investment. Mm -hmm. So they don't do it. And when, then when they reach the, the cap, uh, they, they reach the ceiling and then it hurts <laughs> because the price goes up very, very high. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the European Commission and say, oh, please, uh, give us a bit more uh, quotas because otherwise we will die and there will be unemployment, etc. And then the European Commission say, okay, 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 we, w we don't want you to die, so we give you a bit more quotas. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why it doesn't work well. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of pressure on the Euro European Commission to give more quotas. So it's, uh, it should be, um, if, we, if we go on for this option, then we need to be uh, very strict on the fact that we, there will be no over quotas. Mm -hmm. and, um, but on the other side, we could also have a tax and the, the something in between would be to have a, a market with a minimum price, which amounts about the same to the same as a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. But it's not technically a tax. But if you have a minimum price, then you are able to to make decisions about the investments that you do, and then you do these investments, mm -hmm. and then in the end you respect your cap, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and that's that's better. And then the price will not uh, will not soar. Cedric, what do you think? Um, um, already on the topic of uh, regulations, because carbon tax would have to be a regulation. What do you consider should be um, a priority in terms of government regulations to foster the acceleration of uh, carbon neutrality? Um, so, yeah, the, the, so the carbon price is the one uh, very first priority. Then sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes it's more, it may be more efficient to, to ban things or to, uh, or to impose uh, things. So, for instance, uh, in a thermal, re thermal insulation in the buildings, uh, the government could make decisions like uh, by, uh, 2020, uh, by 2022, for instance, you cannot sell your flat anymore if it's below a certain class in terms of, uh, of consumption per square meter. So, okay, you want to sell your flat, then first make a thermal insulation uh, and then you will be able to sell it. And by doing that, they will force everybody to, to improve the efficiency of, uh, of the different uh, apartments and, uh, and uh, housing. So that's, that's one measure uh, to impose calculations like, like uh, carbon footprint is a very useful thing also because you cannot uh, manage something that you don't measure. So you cannot reduce something that you don't measure. So it's, it's important to impose, to force the companies to make these measurements. 
and also uh, to force companies to to show, for instance, the, the figures like to show the carbon content of a product. That would be very useful for the people to make decisions. Um, and uh, and maybe also help the consumer to have the right information on the products, like the life expectancy of a product. Uh, is a product repairable? If you are able to repair a product, yeah. it's not the same thing as if you cannot. Yeah. In France, something very new has occurred in, in that. It's, uh, uh, I think it's the uh, beginning of this year or beginning of last year, I don't remember. <clears throat> so in, uh, for certain devices like electronics, the, um, the reseller are forced to show um, a quotation, uh, an assessment of the repairability of these products. Yeah, the repairability and, index. Yeah, exactly. And this will be very, very powerful. It will take a few a few months, maybe a few years before before people really uh, care about it. But in the end, they will, and uh, they will start to think, okay, if I if I buy this stuff, okay, it's not it's not expensive, but it will last one year, and then it's done, and I have to to buy another one. But this one is a bit more expensive, but okay, it's repairable, so I know that I can go to a to a shop to have it repaired and. Uh, and it will last uh, five, uh, six years, and so it it will it will change things in the long term. So that has to be in, imposed mm -hmm. by the states. Yes, and uh, I yeah, and I believe that will also be a a, a great step towards incentivizing the creation of a, um, a, a circular passport, where then we can uh, use materiously more abundance and keep them in the, in the loop if we have that passport. Some sectors like the, the aviation uh, are not considered in the Paris Agreement um, and are still not obliged to do anything for reducing greenhouse gases. And so the individual, uh, when considering their contribution um, um, and considering the emissions that uh, industries do, and uh, just a simple flight to the States, for example, compared to what the normal emissions of an individual, they feel that they can't do nothing compared to that. How do we, can we tackle this difference uh, from such big emissions to the small in emissions of individuals? Yeah, so first, um, it's not because we didn't do anything so far that we cannot. Well, in fact, it's, it's not in the Paris, in the Paris Agreement, you're right, but it's, it's in the EU, EU ETS mm -hmm. uh, for a few years. So that's a good point. <clears throat> and then, see, um, in your consumption, there are things that you can uh, you can get rid of for uh, quite easily. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, if you if you decide to divide by two the quantity of meat that you eat, it's not a big effort. Yeah, that's my strategy and actually. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's an individual decision. Nobody will uh, prevent you from doing that. I mean, nobody can say, okay, you have to, you have to go on eating meat, otherwise uh, I lose my job. I don't care if you lose your job. It's an individual decision. And for plane, it's, a, it's about the same. Maybe, maybe you don't give up flying, but maybe you start to think about, wow, will I really go to this place for just two days? Mm -hmm. Like uh, four hours of plane for only two days of, uh, of a weekend or something? So maybe not. And, uh, and individually, people may make decisions the to reduce things and uh, because because it's it's really a lot of emission for a little benefit mm -hmm. so maybe i dream a little bit but uh, but con working on the consciousness of the people can do something about flying mm -hmm. so then if less people fly then uh, the, the 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 companies will have to maybe Maybe the volume will reduce, and if the vol volume of flights reduces, maybe they will increase the price to cope with that. By doing that, there will be even less people, and it's, it will become a luxury in the end to fly. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I don't think I don't think there will be no more plane in uh, in ten, twenty, even thirty years. There will be still a lot of planes, mm -hmm. but much less than today. So. Much, le uh, much less planes, 
it means maybe the same turnover for the companies and why not the same benefit mm -hmm. i mean maybe maybe less turnover maybe less incomes but the same why not the same benefit it's uh, you don't know yeah. you don't know because it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a different way of thinking yeah already some companies aviation companies are working towards uh, eliminating routes when they're are uh, train alternatives to do those same routes. Yeah, but that's little. I mean, you gain, you gain a, full, a full percentage. Yeah. It's not at the right uh, level. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so first, we, we need political uh, measures about uh, flying. We need to have, uh, for instance, in France, we are talking about uh, banning the plane, uh, the plane when uh, you have an alternative with the train uh, less than uh, two, uh, two hours and a half or something like that. Mm -hmm. It should be uh, it should be the same with a diff with a longer journey, mm -hmm. and um, so that's a good start. Uh, you can do that, mm -hmm. and then um, and then we one day or another we need to to be able to put a carbon tax on the fuel for the plane, and that's that's something you can do even if it's a, even if all the countries don't do it, it's still something feasible. You you start slowly, yeah, and maybe they will follow you. Yeah, yeah. Well, the climate fresh is also helping there because uh, it is practiced both in uh, um, in Air France and also here uh, in KLM and uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah. So yeah, exactly, hopefully yeah. it uh, is helping and it is for, for sure yeah. in helping changing over hearts and, wise, uh, and, and minds and uh, altering the strategy. Um, so we're reaching uh, the, the end of our session and I wanted to ask you some final questions about the, the climate fresque specifically um, and about the design of the climate fresque uh, because one of the criticisms that is done of the climate fresque is that uh, it's not it's focused towards awareness so that's the design uh, and it's not so much prone to action and so I believe that's designed on purpose that way could you explain why you designed it this way yeah um Actually, I tried to put cars with solutions mm -hmm. and I did not manage to do it because it's quite impossible to get. You cannot have cars from IPCC report mm -hmm. and just just beside these cars, you put cars of solutions that are completely political, uh, personal. You know, it's, uh, when, when I decide, when I tried to put some solutions, I was thinking, well, that's my idea of a solution is <laughs> not a general one. I mean, who am I to, to give you, even if I give you s s several proposals for solution, I give you some choices. Who am I to tell you the different choices that you have? So it's a very different nature. The, the cards of the, the fresque is about causes and consequences of climate change is based on science and the solutions are political. So it's very different. And and I think, and I think that more and more, that the solutions are in the hands of the people. And, <clears throat> and I really think even the people who like me, who, who work on that topic for a long time, the more I work on that, the less, the less sure I am about the solutions. <laughs> and, uh, and I start to think that maybe some solutions, some very, very important solutions will come from the people who today still don't know nothing about the climate mm. but in the next year they will hear about it and they will have ideas that i never had before mm -hmm. and there there are uh, seven and a half billion people on earth and we will need the imagination of these seven and a half billion people yeah. to find a solution so it's really about that it's really about i give you the issue and um, and we'll talk about the solution and Everybody has to give his opinion about uh, what can be done. And the, the, the facilitator is here to just to, to guide the discussion and to bring people toward the, the most intelligent questions, mm -hmm. but not to give answers. Mm -hmm. and, but still, people will do the fresh and when they, <clears throat> when they leave, uh, they, they usually want to act. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, they really... Uh, at the end of the workshop, people really want to, to, to take action and to, to do something about it. Yes, I can I can vouch for that. Um, Cedric, what are the next steps for the climate fresque? Um, so it has had a tremendous uh, uh, growth. Uh, I assume it will be growing still 
uh, a lot uh, in the near uh, and long future. Let's hope that climate awareness will become uh, mainstream. Um, what are your plans for the near future, for next year? And uh, what uh, next steps would you like to take to 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 bring the, the message of the climate change, uh, uh, climate risk forward? Mm. Well, the, um, I think it, it, the, the purpose is to go on like that because it's uh, uh, the, what is powerful with that project is that it's very focused on one tool. The climate risk is one workshop, is one tool, and uh, and we our job is just to uh, to deploy it, to to roll it out as largely as possible. So. The, te the next steps in, in terms of figures is that we we want to reach one million. It's going to be done within next year, mm -hmm. uh, in 2022. Um, and then once we have reached this goal, we will uh, have another target, which will be, I guess, one million facilitators worldwide. That's going to be the next target. And uh, and then and then maybe we'll talk about a billion people someday. But uh, um, anyway. Yeah, we really want to 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 get global to have uh, associations in many many places uh, who will be able to 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 roll out the game in the different countries mm -hmm. and um, and hopefully with the help of some governments because they may think that uh, it is useful. Mm -hmm. In fact, nothing will happen without a, a certain level of consciousness. Uh, you need consciousness to to bring the right people uh, in in place of power to to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And once you have people who can make decisions, who have political people to to make decisions, right decisions about climate, then you also need awareness for people to accept these decisions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will refuse it. I mean, you may have a few people who you may have uh, a majority of people who bring. To the power, some uh, some uh, nice guys about climate, and then they make decisions. But if if you have 20, 30 people, uh, 20, 30 percent of the population who are really, really angry about about your proposals and your regulations and your new law, etc., it can be a mess. I mean, it can be a civil war. Mm -hmm. So you really need to bring awareness to a very, very large scale in the population to to help deploy. Uh, new regulations about climate. Uh, Cedric, thank you so much uh, for, for that answer and for joining us today. Um, You're welcome. It was a, a true pleasure. Um, the Climate Fresque uh, is a front runner in the fight against climate change and creating meaningful impact uh, in environment, people and uh, business. Um, Later this month, we will be hosting Melly Pullman, uh, Professor Melly Pullman, actually, Chair of Sustainability Supply Chain Management at the University of Groningen in uh, the Netherlands. Um, so keep tuned uh, to see our, our, our next uh, talk with her. Um, so that's all for today. My name is Sergio Jacinto. I'm a Sustainability Transition Manager, uh, expert in circular economy and the founder of Sustainability Literacy. I hope you enjoyed the talk today with Cédric Riegenbach, founder and chairman of the Association La Fresque du Climat. Thank you so much and see you next time. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Cédric.